What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kafinas. Today, I speak with Bill Browder. Bill was the founder and CEO of Hermitage Capital, the largest foreign investor in Russia until 2005 when he was deported from the country. The start of a long saga that culminated in the murder of his lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, after uncovering a $230 million fraud committed by Russian government officials using companies owned by Browder and his investors. Bill has since been leading a campaign to expose endemic corruption and human rights abuses in Putin's Russia, a subject he chronicles extensively in his 2015 best-selling book, Red Notice. Today's discussion begins with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the plundering of its industries and resources by the oligarchs and the consolidation of power in the hands of Vladimir Putin. How did the promises of reform and the opening of Soviet Russia, Perestroika and Glasnost by Mikhail Gorbachev in the 1980s lead so quickly to the traumatic redistribution of wealth into the hands of a tiny kleptocracy? What were the mechanisms that facilitated this plundering and what role have ill-gotten gains played in the mechanics of post-Soviet Russia? How important is corruption to the functioning of the Russian state? And how would a curtailing of bribery, fraud, and murder represent an existential threat to the current regime? Finally, what does Bill's personal story, one that represents both the benefits of and the perils associated with proximity to power and influence in Putin's Russia, portend about the future of this powerful nation? As always, you can join our email list by visiting the show's website at hiddenforcespod.com. If you listen to Hidden Forces on your iPhone or Android, make sure to subscribe. If you like the show, write us a review. And if you want a sneak peek into how each episode is made or for special storylines told through pictures and questions, then like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod. And now, let's get right to this week's conversation. So, Bill Browder, welcome to Hidden Forces. Great to be here. Thank you. I'm very excited to have you on the program. This is obviously a timely discussion, the topic of, of Russia, the Russian government, uh, the way it works, the economy, the United States, all this stuff. And as I mentioned to you, a fan of our show, a listener actually recommended your book to me, and he has lived for a very long time in Russia, and I, and I read it read notice and uh it read like a thriller i mean it, it it did read like a novel in some ways but it's also a really deep book in terms of the subjects that you cover and we're going to get into all those things i've got that all sort of laid out here but before we do could you give your uh, a background sort of you know what your background is for our audience yeah sure so um you can hear my american accent i, I was born in princeton new jersey raised in chicago but I come from a very strange American family in that my grandfather, who was from Kansas, was a labor union organizer in the 1920s. And he, he was so good at organizing the union that the communists spotted him from Russia. And they said, if you like labor unionism, you're going to love communism. Why don't you come and check it out? And so my grandfather in 1927 went to Moscow. He ended up uh, finding a uh, pretty Russian girl who became my grandmother. And my father was born over there. And then, um, then they went back to America in 1932, and he became the leader of the Communist Party of America and stayed in that position for 13 years. So I was born in, in 1964. I'm 53 years old. And um, when I was going through my teenage rebellion in the 1970s, I thought, what's the best way to rebel from a family of communists? And uh, <laughs> I uh, came up with this great idea of uh, putting on a suit and tie and becoming a capitalist. And so that's what I did. I became a capitalist. I went to Stanford Business School. I graduated business school in 1989, which was the year the Berlin Wall came down. And as I was trying to figure out what to do with my career, I had this epiphany, which was that if my grandfather is the, was the biggest communist in America and the Berlin Wall has just come down, I'm going to try to become the biggest capitalist in Eastern Europe. And that's what I set out to do. And I eventually found my way to Russia at the beginning of the Russian privatization program. I... Um, set up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund to invest Western capital in these 
newly privatized companies? Well, we're going to get into that because I actually want to ask you, sorry to interrupt, I want to start with Poland a bit before we get there. Sure. But before we do that, I also had a specific question for you. As I said, I, I really took the time to read your book. And one of the questions I have for you is, in looking at how your life unfolded, and we'll get into some of the choices that you made along your path, particularly after 1996, and then again in 2005, I think those were important moments, how your childhood and your upbringing, you may think when reflecting on that, sort of made you who you are and influenced the choices that you ended up making in certain crucial moments in your experience in Russia. Yeah. Well, so to focus a little bit on my family and my childhood, I came from a family. So my grandfather, as I mentioned, was this communist, and he had three sons, my father and two of my uncles. And all three of these sons of my grandfather all, strangely, um, became mathematicians. My father was a genius, child prodigy. He went to MIT at the age of 14, skipping high school, graduated at the age of 17, and went to Princeton and had his PhD in mathematics by the time he was 21. My um, uncles, and he became or the head of the math department at the University of Chicago. My other, my uncle Bill um, became the head of the math department at Princeton. My uncle Andy became head of the math department at Brown University. And so it was pretty well expected um, that I would um, follow in the family footsteps of academia. And my brother followed my father's footsteps. He skipped high school as well. And at the age of 15, he enrolled in the University of Chicago and, and uh, graduated Phi Beta Kappa in physics by the time he was 18. So there I was in this family of you know unbelievable achievers. In my immediate family, I wasn't really up to the task of skipping high school and going to Caltech or MIT. I was just a regular kid. And so it was kind of an oppressive situation because I couldn't really do what everyone else was doing. And so I had to find my own way. And that's sort of where business came in. And, and it was also, of course, to poke them back a little bit since I felt so bad about not being a genius that I decided to become a businessman. <laughs> you were going to compensate for your sort of uh, lack of intellectual achievements with making a lot of money, which uh, you did. So that kind of brings us to the, where the story really begins to kick off. And for me, you know, the one area I wanted to touch on before we get into Russia is Poland, because you had an early experience in Eastern Europe where you went to Poland. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and how that informed your later decision to go eastward, further east into Russia? So the Poland thing started out, it was my first job out of business school was a, a job in the Boston Consulting Group, which is a management consulting firm in London. I had gone to London to BCG because I was interested in Eastern Europe. I told them I was interested in Eastern Europe. And they said, well, if we ever have anything in Eastern Europe, you'll be our guy. And uh, so I go to, go to work at BCG. And one day the, the partner knocks on my door and says, hey, you were the guy who wanted Eastern Europe, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, pack, pack your bags. You're going off to Poland. And so they sent me off to this little town called Sanok which is located about six and a half hours from Warsaw on the Ukrainian-Slovakian border. And this town of Sanok had one company, which was a, a bus manufacturing company called Autosan. And BCG had been hired by the World Bank to advise the Polish government on what to do with this company. And the problem with the company was that they had lost all their customers. No one wanted to buy Polish buses anymore. And so they had lost like 90% of their sales. And so I was 25 years old, didn't know a thing about business, buses, or anything. And since there wasn't the fees weren't very large, I was sent there by myself to try to turn around this failing bus company. It was a very upsetting time to be there because everyone in the whole town was depending on me to come up with some kind of radical solution that would fix their problems. But there was only one solution that could fix a problem of a company with that's had 90% of their sales evaporate, which is to get rid of 90% of their costs. And it didn't feel very good to me to go into this town and make lists of people to be fired, but that's effectively what, what my job was. But And so it was kind of demoralizing. And one day when I was walking around the factory, I had this guy who was with me. His name is Leszek. He was my permanent translator since I didn't speak Polish. And um, I noticed under Leszek's arm that they had a, he had a newspaper. And uh, on the newspaper, on the front of the newspaper, were all these seemingly financial figures. And I, I said to Leszek, I said, hey, Leszek, what's that you got on your arm? And he said, oh, this is the very first privatizations in Poland. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Could you explain them to me? And so we sat down in the conference room. He laid out the newspapers on a table. And I asked him, I started saying, well, what's this number? He said, well, th this is the, the number of shares outstanding. 
And I said, what's this number? He said, this is the share price that they're selling the shares. And and it was $80 million. And then I went down to the next line. I said, what's this number? And he, he said, uh, that's net income. I said, what do you mean net income? Like, no. He said, no, that's net income. And that number was $160 million. So just to repeat the math for you, the company had a value of $80 million, and the last year's net income was $160 million. Hmm. So Trading at half its income, its annual income. Ha- yeah, so basically, the company, all it had to do was stay in business for six months, and you have effectively, on an economic basis, made your money back. And so I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and I thought, well, isn't this what I went to business school for? It was like, this is it. And so... Um, I said, well, how do we buy shares? And he said, he explained it all to me. And and so I took my entire life savings, which at the time was $2,000. And I went down to the post office with Leszek. And we converted the dollars to Zloty, which is the currency there. And I subscribed to the very first privatizations. And and, uh, I got shares. And um, two things happened. One, I made my final recommendation to the bus company and to the World Bank. And Thankfully, they uh, ignored my recommendation and continued subsidizing the company, so nobody got fired, which was a great relief to me because I didn't want these people to be out of work. But the best thing that happened was that about a year after I bought these first shares, they went up 10 times. And so my $2,000 turned into $20,000. And you actually wrote in your book, you have this one quote that I pull out here. You wrote, for those who don't know, the sensation of finding a 10-bagger is the financial equivalent of smoking crack cocaine. Once you've done it, you want to repeat it over and over and over as many times as you can. And boy, is that true. I, I, um, I can tell you that, that that's, it's just uh, a glorious thing when you figure something out that no one else has and, and you've been rewarded and, and you got the money and, and you can see your success. And, and it's not even about the money. I mean, I, I, it was more about just the sort of validation of, of being right. Right. And so I knew then, after making this 10-bagger, that was what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to go and find other situations like this in this frontier of Eastern Europe where they were doing these privatizations. And I decided to become an investor, and that's what I set out to do. And you were 27 years old at the time? How old were you? I was 26 years old at the time. Very young. I was very young. But I should point out that it didn't really matter how young I was because nobody else in that part of the world had any more experience than me. It was all completely wide open, new frontier. It right. wasn't like there's was a bunch of guys who had been around for 25 years ahead of me who were you know, keeping the young guys out. I was just right. as experienced as anybody. In fact, more because nobody else had done anything in the, from the West. Right. And here you were four years out of college at a time when the world was shifting, the poles were shifting in terms of power, and the Cold War was over abruptly, and uh, there was this whole sort of reorganization of Eastern Europe and, and Russia. And that leads us down the path to Salomon and Bobby Ludwig and your initial investment in Russia. You know, in the interest of time, I don't want to spend too much time going through every single detail because I do want to get to the sort of the most exciting part of this, which is your starting Hermitage Capital, which was your hedge fund with Edmund Safra and other investors. But you made an initial, as I understand it, you made another initial, your first investment in Russia with Salomon under Bobby Ludwig for $25 million. That $25 million became, if I'm not mistaken, $125 million. And then you sort of had the opportunity or made the decision that you wanted to strike it on your own, and you went ahead and did that. Is that right? That's a perfect description of how it played out next in the next chapter of my Eastern European adventure. So you describe very sort of in great detail what that process was like. It's not a huge part of the book, but I am interested in your experience of Edmund Safra as someone, you know, personally, and I'm sure many in the audience have not played at that level. I think that's an interesting thing. Maybe you could just give us just a little bit about who Edmund was, how that process began, and then how sort of you got into Russia with the fund and how you began to invest. Well, so the most important part of this chapter is that once I figured out what was going on in Russia, I thought, this is like better than Poland. You know, I made 10 times my money in Poland, and, and the Russians were privatizing their stuff at like a fraction of the Polish valuation. So I, I knew that there was huge, huge money to be made in the Russian privatizations. And so I set out to raise an investment fund to invest in Russia. And one of the people who I met was a man. His name was Edmund Safra. Edmund was the owner of a famous bank that doesn't exist anymore. It was called Republic National Bank of New York. 
which sounds kind of bureaucratic and sort of not commercial bank-like, but it was nothing like that at all. Ed, Edmund Zafra, he was a um, Syrian Jew who had lived all over the world in, in Brazil and Italy and Switzerland and so on, and, and probably one of the best investors I've ever come across. This man had just golden touch. And I had an opportunity through another person who was a client of Solomon Brothers to meet Edmund Safra when I was setting out to raise my fund. And it was a very unusual situation. I was told to um, go down to the pier in front of the Carlton Hotel in Cannes, south of France. That was the instructions I was given. So I go out there with my suit. I'm standing at the pier, and I'm supposed to be there at noon. And and this white speedboat comes up to the um, pier and picks me up. And then we go hurtling across the Mediterranean towards a, a little port called Villefranche. We park the boat, and a black Mercedes picks me up and takes me up to this house on the top of the hill. It was called La Leopolda. It was named after um, King Leopold of Belgium. And there's no exaggeration to say this is the most expensive house in the world. And we come up to this house, and there's all these ex mossad guys in black outfits with guns all patrolling the grounds. And I, I go into there and walk into this house. It's got all this art and, and uh, chandeliers and so on. And I walk into this big room overlooking the, the Mediterranean. And in walks this little man, Edmund Safra. There was nothing impressive about how he looked. But um, when we sat down and I explained to him what was going on in Russia, he immediately saw the value. And I should point out that this was at a time when nobody saw the value he immediately saw the value. He saw that there was something really amazing going on. What allowed him to see the value in your view? I mean, because this is also important, right? Because we're talking about investing not simply in, this is not a normal investment. This is an investment that's informed by geopolitical dynamics and internal politics in Russia and all these different factors. And you have to go physically on the ground and investigate and identify. And in a world where you do so much from a computer today, this was very much the opposite. And I'm curious how he and you, well, you, you understand you were there. That was sort of, you had that experience in Poland and again in Russia. But a guy like Edmund and, you know, how much was that you're explaining to him the opportunity like you did, for example, with Bobby at Salomon? And how much was that his just vast knowledge and connections as who he was that allowed him to understand that opportunity, and capitalize on it? Well, in a certain way, he was a very unsophisticated guy. You couldn't like use financial jargon or, you know, he, he wasn't interested in computers and math. He was just interested in risk reward. And, and the way I explained it to him was very straightforward and, and a normal you know, a person who's just looking clearly without all the bells and whistles at risk reward would understand this very simply, which was that I explained to him that at the time, the Russian stock market was trading at a 99.7% discount to the value of similar companies in the West. And the reason, it was, and the reason it was at such a discount, it was at such a discount because there was a very real chance that a year afterwards or two years afterwards, they would take it all away from you. And so the way that I looked at it and the way that Edmund looked at it was very simple, which is he said, okay, if it's trading at a 99.7% discount, let's just say that it goes to like a 95% discount. At that point, you've made like 10, 15 times your money. And okay, so if it works out, and, and how does it go from 99.7 to a 95% discount? Very simply, because they just don't take it away from you. And the rest of the world figures out about it a little later after you've already bought in. And that's Sedanko's price pretty much. I mean, I, there are obviously other ones, but if I'm not mistaken, Sedanko it would fall in that category, right? So everything fell in that category, some more than others. Sedanko was definitely in, in that category. But, but just coming back to Edmund for one second. So there was on the reward side, you can make 10 or 15 times your money. And on the risk side, they could take it all away from you. You could lose everything. And so mm -hmm. Edmund wasn't, you know, doing mathematical equations and all the all nonsense. He was just saying, <laughs> okay, let's just look at the probabilities. So let's just say there's a 50% probability that they don't take it away from you. And, and if that's the case, then I make, let's say, 10 times my money. And he says, okay, and let's say there's a 50% chance that I lose everything. Then I goes to zero. Any rational investor would take some of their money and invest it in that risk reward because- mm -hmm. That has a huge high expected value. In mm -hmm. other words, if you could like t do those types of trades that are unconnected to each other or uncorrelated all over the world, you'd do that all day long. And Edmund saw that, and most everybody else, all they could see is that there was some probability, 
that you lose everything. And so nobody wanted to touch it if there was some probability you could lose everything. And that was what 99% of world's investors thought at the time, was just that I don't want to go anywhere near it. They could take it all away. So I didn't mean to drop. I was just going to say, and this is also for our audience, we've talked about this, the challenges that investors have and people have thinking probabilistically and uh, thinking across the entire, all their asset allocations and investment decisions. And, and you know, I just wanted to just throw that out there. I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about, but go ahead. And so um, Edmund saw it, nobody else did, and, and he became my first investor. He put up $25 million in the Hermitage Fund, and we were off to the races, and they didn't take it away. And so in the first 18 months of our fund's operation, the fund went up 850%. So let's talk about this period. This is 96, right? So we started the fund. I moved to Moscow. started the fund April 1996. So in our conversation, the way I've structured it and the way I'm thinking about it, there are sort of three parallel tracks. And the third one we're going to get to, which is the human tragedy and the human component to the story on a very personal level for you and for some of the people around you. And that's going to tie into politics here in the United States. But another one is this, or the two parallel tracks, one of this exhilarating experience of having a chance to be a young man, a young person in a changing landscape and having an opportunity to win and experience that thrill. And then there's the other part, which is the unfolding tragedy within the Russian economy and within the Russian body politic, which was what the Russian people refer to as diffamistically as kakistroika which was this the process of the privatization through which the oligarchy rose in Russia and eventually led to the consolidation of power of Vladimir Putin, which is something I would love to get into with you. But perhaps you can walk us through how the privatization worked, for example, the use of vouchers and later the loans for shares and how that process occurred and how you essentially as a foreign investor were able to insert yourself in a process that itself was the Russian connected and wealthy and elite taking basically ownership of the Soviet public infrastructure for themselves. The Russian government, Boris Yeltsin, who was the president of Russia at that time, made a very strategic choice. He said, in order to go from communism to capitalism, I need to create a country full of capitalists. And in order to do that, I need to transfer state property from the hands of the state to the hands of individuals. And so they created this thing called the Mass Privatization Program, and there was a number of different features of that. The one which I was most interested in was something called the Voucher Privatization Program. And the Voucher Privatization Program was this program where they gave a physical voucher to every person over the age of 18 in Russia. And these vouchers were freely exchangeable, freely tradable. You could swap it for a bottle of vodka. You could burn it. You could give it. You could take it. And as a result, these vouchers traded for about $20 each. And so if you do the math, there was 150 million people in the country times $20 gets you to $3 billion of the vouchers. And those $3 billion worth of vouchers were exchangeable for 30% of the share capital of all Russian companies. And what that meant was that the market value of the entire country of Russia was $10 billion. And I should point out that this is a country with uh, 35% of the world's natural gas, 10% of the world's oil, 10% of the world's steel, 10% of the world's aluminum. There's fertilizer, there's car companies, there's banks, there's everything. The entire value of the country, $10 billion. You couldn't get a, like a mid-sized US oil company for that. And there you can get the whole Russian country. Just to clarify that for myself and for the audience, the vouchers that were issued were cumulatively exchangeable for 30% of the shares in Russian companies, which represented basically the economy in the context of what you're saying. And in informal markets, they were trading at, as you write in the book, a $7 bottle of vodka or a few slabs of pork. It wasn't that the vouchers themselves had a price attached to them, it's that simply Russians were willing to sell them because they didn't know any better or because they were starving and it was in the midst of an economic crisis. Is that correct? Yeah. So that, that basically, you know, people all got given these shares for free and then, then they started to trade. And so, I mean, some people held on to them, some people invested them, other people didn't. But as a result, there was a sort of a voucher exchange started up and anyone could go there. And it really was a level playing field. There's like nobody had any advantage over anybody else there other than those people who figured it out, had an advantage over the people who hadn't figured it out, but there was no scam going on. 
So that took care of 30% of the share capital of Russian companies. But well, the Russian government came up with some other scams, which were basically scams to benefit the oligarchs. And the, the main scam was something called the Loans for Shares program. And this was basically a situation where certain oligarchs were basically given the opportunity to buy some of the biggest oil companies and metals companies in the world for nothing through rigged auctions where they were the guaranteed declared in advance winners. And that's where the real sort of ugliness began because what that did and is it created a group of people known as the oligarchs. We all know who oligarchs are now. We didn't back then. Cool. Who were they then before they became the oligarchs? Were they just people that were connected to the bureaucracy somehow? No, these were what I would call the sharpest elbowed guys in the room. These were people who were basically ready to do anything to get rich. And a lot of people in Russia didn't understand, you know, these new markets. They didn't understand capitalism. And so, you know, you had the most regular people were just like sort of going about their lives, not understanding what was going on. But you had these few people, and there was 22 of them, who basically broke every rule and threatened every person and did everything they needed to do to end up in a situation where they ended up becoming the richest men in the world by doing this. And I say men, there's actually one woman who was the uh, wife of the mayor of Moscow, but everybody else... They're all men, and they all became rich beyond anything any of us could ever imagine. I mean, the amount of money they made was just extraordinary. And and not only were they rich, but they flaunted their wealth. And so if you went down to the south of France, you could see all these huge yachts sitting off the coast. And these were all these yachts owned by these Russian oligarchs who had basically stolen the money from the Russian state. It was a plundering. And there was this centrifuge action, right? This network that was actually sucking the shares from the periphery, basically going to wherever shares existed, getting them at, at a price in a village or whatever else, collecting them, getting them into blocks, selling them at larger prices into larger blocks, et cetera, until they got into Moscow, where they were in these exchanges. Maybe you can explain how that worked, but essentially where where you and others would be able to bid on or be able to use those vouchers to exchange them for shares in bids? How did that work exactly? I mean, that was the opportunity, right? So let's say that somebody in a little village in Siberia got their voucher like everybody else. And and so what would happen was like, you know, some local character would say, hey, I'll trade you a bottle of vodka for the voucher. And a lot of people said, yeah, sure. So they'd maybe spend five or seven dollars for the bottle of vodka, they'd trade it for the voucher, and then they get like 10 vouchers in this little village. So, so let's say they spent seven bucks per voucher, uh, and they put 70 bucks into the whole trade, and they get 10 of these things. And then they take the 10 vouchers to like the next town over, which is slightly bigger, and they would sell those 10 vouchers to some guy in that town for $10 per voucher. And then that guy would buy you know 10 from one guy and 10 from another, and he put together, let's say, 150 of these things. And then he would take his 150 vouchers and sell them for $13 to another place that's like 200 miles away, which is a bit, was sort of a city. And then that guy would, would collect 150 from this guy, 150 from that guy. And, and eventually he would put together a block of, let's say, 2,000 vouchers. And then he would travel all the way to Moscow and he'd pay, let's say, $13 for his vouchers. And then from there, the guy who would have put together a big block in Moscow and he'd sell them to foreign investors and other people and whoever else had real money for $20 a voucher. So everybody would be making money along this chain, but at $20 a voucher, it still values the whole country at, at uh, $10 billion, which is nothing. Hmm. And eventually those shares, those vouchers found themselves their way to Moscow where they would be exchanged for shares in the actual companies. Right. So then this was sort of a crazy thing. The way that they organize the, um, the what they call the voucher auctions for shares is that every week or two, they would announce what shares were being put up for sale. They would say, we're putting up a block of Luke Oil, 6% of the shares of Luke Oil for vouchers. And then the way that the voucher auction worked is that anyone could show up and bid their vouchers. And you had no idea what price per share of Luke Oil you're paying. It all depended on how many people showed up with their vouchers. So if one person showed up with one voucher, you get the entire block for one remarkable, voucher. Remarkable, remarkable. If a million people showed up, and you only knew afterwards. And so it was kind of insane to be doing it because whoever bids in an auction where you don't know the price. 
And what was even crazier about it is that nobody even knew who these companies were because they were all sort of a state secret in the previous moments. And so as a result, you know, you'd have companies that people knew about. Like, let's say they knew that everyone drives around a car called the Lada. And so um, the company that makes Lada is called Optovaz. And so, you know, when the Optovaz auction came up, everybody knew it. And so they bid lots of vouchers wow. for this car company. Wow. But like nobody was bidding on Luke Oil because no one wow. knew what Luke Oil was. And so this stuff, you know, you'd go to the voucher auction, you buy some vouchers, you go to the voucher auction, you submit it. And because nobody knew what any of this stuff was, people weren't being all that competitive about it. And so basically just going to the voucher auction and then submitting your vouchers, and you, then you wait three weeks and get your shares, always it would trade up like 500% the moment you got your shares. And it was just, you know, basically free money. And of course, there was an incentive to prohibit or to disincentivize people to attend the auctions that would be for the most lucrative companies if you were an insider and knew which company was. So the process, the entire process was ripe for corruption and it was corrupted. And that process was the process by which the entire Russian economy and political system was reset after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Is that a fair thing to say? Well, I mean, some of them were highly corrupted. Some of them were transparent. So it all depended. But like, to just give you an example, one of the biggest oil companies in Russia is an oil company called Surgut Neftegas, mm. and it's rumored to be owned by Putin right now. Surgut Neftegas, when they had their voucher auction, in order to participate, you had to actually go into Siberia and go to the town of Surgut in Siberia. And so... What do they do? They close the airport the day before the auction, so no, <laughs> no planes can fly in for anyone to submit their vouchers. Wow. Another place, they would like put burning tires on the road to stop people from coming in. And so there was a lot of that kind of silliness going on. But I would say the voucher, the voucher system was not particularly horrifyingly corrupt the way the other ones were. But you know, there was like definitely the loans these for examples. Share, like the loans for shares, for example. Like the loans for shares, for sure. Could you explain that? The way I understand that is... Essentially, the private sector, people within, you know, the private wealth in Russia that had been accumulated was able to lend money to the government, which was, was going broke, basically, which we've covered in the collapse of long-term capital management, which was initiated by the 1998 default, hard default by Russia, by the Russian government. But they were essentially, if I'm not mistaken, lending money to the government, which was in return giving them shares in these companies. Is that right? This was a total scam. So the government was basically saying... We don't have any money, which is kind of absurd. I mean, the government didn't have any money, but it's not like these. Well, actually, let me let me take a step back. So the oligarchs, who were the rich guys at the time, all owned banks. And so they all had banks. Vladimir Putin, for example. All these guys had banks. And so with the banks, the way they, they went about their business is that they would get a banking license. And then they would go to some minister in the government, let's say the minister of defense, and say to the minister, hey, if you put your money on deposit at my bank for zero interest, and I should point out, this is a time of hyperinflation, so the interest, so the inflation rate is 150%, mm -hmm. and the bond yields are 175%. So the banker is going to the Minister of Defense, say, put your $500 million in my bank for no interest, and at the end of the year, I will put $10 million in a Swiss bank for you. So mm -hmm. the Minister of Defense puts $500 million in the oligarch's bank, the oligarch wow. then goes out and buys government bonds with at 175% yield. Wow. And at the end of the year, um, he gets 175% return on his on the money. He puts $10 million in the Swiss bank and he's got all the money. The Ministry of Defense has now gotten their the value of their deposits has just dropped dramatically because of the inflation. And so the Russian government didn't have money because they were putting all their money in the oligarch's banks. And then to add insult to injury, then they said, "Well, we don't have any money, and so we need to borrow money." So the money that the government put in the oligarchs' banks were then lent back to the government on a highly unusual terms where the government said, and because we're such a risky borrower, we're going to take the shares, 50% of the oil company such and such, and give it to you as collateral. Mm -hmm. And so I realize it's a very complicated story, but so the government doesn't have money because it's in the banks of the oligarchs. They need to borrow that money. They give the oligarchs collateral of these enormously valuable companies. Mm -hmm. And then every single one of these loans then defaults. Yeah, crazy. And so these guys ended up <laughs> getting the most valuable companies in the world. I mean, these are companies the size of Exxon 
for like 100 million bucks. And, and that was 100 million bucks of their own money, 100 million bucks of money that the government had deposited in their banks. And it's fair to say that was planned, that was architected, that wasn't a coincidence. It was f fully thought through, and it wasn't like there was a competition as to who could participate. It was it sort of, they went around the room and divided it up between all the oligarchs, and this oligarch got that one, and that, another oligarch got this one, and, and that was how it all played itself out. Okay, so this is how I see it, having read your book and just knowing a little bit about this on my own. There is this consolidation of money initially, of ownership in the Russian economy that initially happens. You are, at the time, the biggest foreign investor in the country. There are not many investors, foreign investors to speak of. Is that fair to say? Yeah, so the value of my portfolio had risen to $4.5 billion by the time I was at sort of my peak. With how much initial capital? Well, I mean, it started out at, at $25 million, but more money came in along the way. But but at $4.5 if you had come in on day one, Incredible. you would have made something like 35 times your money. So, and your portfolio was up, and this was 1996 still. I mean, it was within the no, same- No, no. So, we started in 1996. By the time I got to 2005, my portfolio oh, had gone up to $4.5 billion. I mean, it was there was a lot of heartache along the way, ups, downs. It went up 850%, down 90%, up 4,500% after that. Well, what I was trying to sort of extract from you there was that initial experience where you had that initial success, right? The fund had the initial success, and it seemed to me, and this is where I would love some clarification, it seemed to me that what was happening in the Russian economy was that this consolidation of money was happening domestically among these new oligarchs, and then whether it was just straight out greed, whether it was some cultural element that you touch on in terms of the fact that you were a foreigner, but there was a desire to take even more, and that's when your stake in Sedanko specifically was diluted from 2.4 to 0.9 percent in a really just totally shady, below board dilution stock issuance by the head of the company, the head of the controlling interests of that company. Could you walk us through how that happened and then how you managed to reverse that? Because I think that's really interesting and relevant, the fact that you were able to appeal to outside investors because Russia was still not an isolated country. And then with the default in 98, how that caused a turn inward for Russia, which brings us, I think, to this interesting period in the consolidation of power, to me, it seems at least, in how sort of we went from consolidating money, the oligarchs emerged, the wealthy, to the consolidation of power in order to bring order to the chaos of Russia, and out of that emerges Vladimir Putin in 2000. Could you walk us through that a little bit? Sure. So the Sedanco was a big oil company. I bought shares really very, very cheaply. 96% of the company was owned by a, a Russian oligarch. I was able to buy two and some odd percent in the sort of illiquid secondary market. And then at some point, I think I paid $11 million for 2.4% or something along those lines. And at some point, British Petroleum came in and bought 10% from this oligarch. And they paid, I think, something like 10 times the price that I had paid. And so my $11 million portfolio was worth more than $100 million. And uh, I was celebrating, popping the champagne, thinking, God, I am so good. And apparently the oligarch was looking over at me and thinking to himself, you shouldn't be getting any of that. That's not your money to get. And so what he did was he um, did a complicated share issue in which he sold shares to at a hugely, hugely discounted price to himself and his buddies, and he excluded me, and it was basically a, an attempt to steal $75 million from me and my investors. And um, I decided to challenge him publicly, and I went through this long, very scary process of- Very scary. First confronting him, and, and that didn't work, and, and then um, taking it to the newspapers, and that didn't work, and there were lots of- nasty threats, and people were all predicting my imminent demise, and I had a whole team of bodyguards going around with me everywhere. That was really scary, Bill. I don't mean to interrupt again, but that's really scary. I mean, what drove you to make that decision to sort of, you could say it's almost, it was almost reckless. Someone could say that was, you know, you'd put yourself at risk, a tremendous risk, though you came out of that. What led you to make that decision to sort of step on the gas in that moment? So I felt like if I allowed this guy to get away with it, if I allowed him to steal from me, then it would just be open season on everybody stealing from me. And that would be the end of my business, the end of my career, and the end of my client's money. 
And I felt some deep sense of responsibility and, and a sense of righteous indignation that these people cannot be allowed to do this. And it just seemed wrong and unfair. And so I took the decision that I'm going to fight these guys. I'm going to go to war with them and I'm going to fight them. And nobody ever did that. Nobody fought, you know, what the oligarchs, these people were, you know, very dangerous individuals. And I went to war with the oligarchs and Edmund Safra sent in a team of, a huge team of bodyguards to look after me. We had, when I was driving around Moscow, we had lead cars and side cars and lag cars and they would come to my apartment and scope out the rooftops for snipers and look for bombs and then escort wow. me in. It was very scary. Very well, scary. I was sort of thinking about how to progress this conversation, but the reality is in many ways, I mean, I don't know what your security situation is now, but certainly as the story progresses and, and we can kind of get to that point, you, you make it through this period and you manage to have those shares returned and not or not diluted. I mean, you basically regain control of your company and the assets that you had. But things in Russia change with the, I think, the collapse in the economy and the default and the turn inward. These investors who were, you know, the oligarchs who were challenging you and the money in your fund and looking to take it from you, they at that point the leverage that foreign investors had over them went away because Russia was basically isolated. They became a financial pariah. And that seemed to really create a much more lawless environment. That environment, of course, led to the uh, ascendancy of Vladimir Putin. Maybe we can just kind of get into then what happened in 2005 rather than try to go through the entire history, just because I feel like you know, just talking to you now, I, I mean, the significance of the choices that you've made and, and where you are today, and, and I do want to get into Sergei Magnitsky and your experience after 2005. Maybe you could just tell us what your experience has been since 2005, since you were detained and returned and went back to London, basically lost hermitage or were, were not able to go back, had to liquidate your fund. What happened there and what has sort of the progression since been and, and what has your life been like? After Sedanko, after this fight with the oligarch, which I won, I developed this fearlessness. I thought, wow, I beat an oligarch. I was able to get completely back whole. And then I started taking on other oligarchs. And for a period of time, Vladimir Putin seemed to be on my side because we were fighting with the same guys. He was fighting with the guys because they were stealing power from him, and I was fighting with these guys because they were stealing money from me. And so for about four years... And I should point out, I never met the guy. I've never met Vladimir Putin. But for about four years, every time I would go into a fight with an oligarch, he would quietly or sometimes very publicly step in on my side with some decree or some action. And it just created this enormously positive situation for me. And the value of my portfolio went up dramatically. And that was all really great until one day he decided to win his war with the oligarchs by arresting the richest man in Russia, a man named Michael Hordakovsky. Just to clarify, you're implying that people assume that you were working under the protection of Vladimir Putin. Nobody knew what the deal was, but they thought, okay, in Russia, everything is a conspiracy. There's no, mm -hmm. nothing is as it seems. <laughs> and so they were saying, there's no way that this guy from Chicago, south side of Chicago, is going to be taking on the oligarchs on his own volition. That just is impossible. That couldn't happen. It just doesn't make sense. And then they're saying, well, well who is he fronting for? And they, they would see that every time I would go after one of these guys, Putin would step in. And so they assumed that this must be like a Putin project, that I was just like some kind of clever Putin trick to uh, go after the oligarchs. And nobody wanted to mess with Putin. And so the unspoken assumption was that you didn't touch Bill Browder. And so, and I wasn't going to alert people to the fact that this was nonsense because mm. it was protecting me. And so for four years, I let people make whatever assumptions they wanted to make. As I said, I never spoke to Putin. I had nothing to do with him, but he was very much... Your enemy's enemy is your friend. And so I was going after his enemies and he was knocking them over as I would go after them. And so that was really a quite a, a successful time for me. But he wasn't doing it because he's a good guy. He was doing it because he wanted to take away the power from the oligarchs because they were stealing that power from him. And he went after the richest guy in Russia at the end of 2003, a guy named Michael Hordakovsky, the owner of an oil company called Yukos, worth $15 billion. They arrested him off his jet in Siberia. They uh, put him on trial, and they allowed the television cameras to come in to the courtroom and film the richest man in Russia sitting in a cage. And that had a tremendous psychological effect on all the other rich guys. Imagine you're 
sitting on your yacht parked off the Hotel du Cap in Antibes, France, and you see a guy far better, far richer, far more powerful than you sitting in a cage. And what's your natural reaction going to be? You, you, you don't want to sit in that cage. And so one by one by one, these guys went back to Putin and said, Vladimir, what do we have to do so we don't sit in a cage? And he said, real simple, 50%. And I'm not talking about 50% for the Russian government or 50% for the presidential administration of Russia. I'm talking about 50% for Vladimir Putin. 50% of what? Of earnings? and, and... No, 50% of everything. Assets, earnings, cash flow, everything. How do we know that number? I've heard you use that number before. Where does that number come from? Is that something that sort of is just spoken of in private circles in Russia? Yeah, everybody knew it. It was well known. It was commonly wow. known because everyone had to do it. And it's been proven. And of course, stay out of politics too, I assume. Don't challenge me in any election, I assume, would also be part of that deal. Yeah, well, the main thing is he wanted the money, but he also didn't want anyone to like unseat wow. him because you know, you get a lot more money in the future if you stay in power. And so he didn't want anyone involved in politics. He wanted half their money. And they all just wanted to like stay out of jail and stay alive. And so he won his war with the oligarchs. But then when he became the richest man in Russia, all of my exposés of corruption against oligarchs was no longer against his enemies. It was going after his own personal financial interests. And that's what led to my expulsion in 2005. I was flying back to Russia from a weekend trip in London, and I was in the VIP lounge at Sheremetyevo 2 Airport, which is their main international airport. And um, I was waiting for my passport to be processed, and they didn't process my passport. Instead, four heavily armed border guards burst into the lounge, grabbed me, frog marched me down to the detention center of the airport, arrested me, kept me there for 15 hours, and then put me on a, on a flight back to London. And subsequently, I got a letter from the foreign ministry of Russia saying that I had been expelled from Russia because I was a threat to national security. And that's when I knew that my troubles were really starting. Okay, so, and there were a lot of interesting sort of the, the process through which you finally came to recognize that is an interesting part of the book as well. You fleshed that out. But, but in the interest of time, why don't we fast forward through to how you responded to that and how that eventually led, what decisions you made in response, and what the consequences have been, and where you are today personally as a result of this process. So after I was expelled, I said to myself, these guys don't tend to go after their enemies mildly. They tend to do so with extreme prejudice. And just being expelled seemed to me to be a pretty mild sanction. And so I, I looked around and said, where am I exposed? And I was exposed in having a big team of people in Moscow. And I was exposed to having a lot of assets in Moscow. And so I instructed all of my people and their families to evacuate and come to London. And then once they got to London, I instructed them to liquidate every holding that we had in Russia as quickly and quietly as we could. And we got everybody out and we got our money out. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that was scary. But we got everybody and everything out. There's nothing much more they could do. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong. 18 months after I was expelled, and I, I should point out that I did keep a small office in Moscow in case the storm ever blew over. And 18 months after I was expelled, 25 police officers raided my office in Moscow. 25 more officers raided the office of an American law firm that I used out there. And they were looking for the stamps, seals, and certificates for our investment holding companies through which we had invested all of our money in Russia, not knowing that these companies were empty. And they found all the stuff at the law firm. They grabbed it. And then the next thing we know, the stamps, seals, and certificates that were seized by the police were then used to fraudulently re-register our empty investment holding companies out of our name into the name of a man who had been convicted of murder and let out of jail early by the police. And I was terrified. I thought, well, I mean, there's no economic issues here. Our money is safe. But I thought, God, if the police are working with murderers to the steal companies, what else could they be doing? And I didn't want to find out. And so I ended up going out and hiring the smartest lawyer I knew in Russia, a young man named Sergei Magnitsky. He was 35 years old at the time. He was one of these guys who could do 10 things in the time it took others to do one. And Sergei Magnitsky went out and investigated. And he came back and he said, there were two parts of this scam. The first didn't work. The second did. He said, the first part was to try to steal your money, but you had gotten your money out safely, so that didn't work. However, the second part did, and the second part was all about 
after when I was liquidating my all of my holdings in Russia uh, the previous year, we had a um, huge profit. We had a billion dollar profit on our on our holdings. And on that billion dollar profit, which was crystallized, we paid a $230 million capital gains tax bill to the Russian government. And what Sergei had realized, what he had figured out, was that the people who stole our companies took those companies to the tax authorities the next year. And they said to the tax authorities, this $230 million of taxes that were paid were paid in error. And they put together a very complicated scheme to prove it or to show it, fraudulent scheme to show it. And they said, therefore, we want the $230 million back. It was the largest tax refund request in the history of Russia. They applied for it on the 23rd of December 2007, two days before Christmas, and it was approved and paid out the next day, no questions asked. So what they did was they basically took your company and turned them into zombie defendants, these companies that you owned, put them in court and proved, you know, in this kangaroo court that they owed back taxes in the sum of $230 million to the state, which then they were able to use as justification for getting tax refunds for their own, I mean, not to the state, sorry, to some other companies, which they then used as a way to get a tax refund, these oligarchs, from the state for the amount equal to the fraudulent tax fraud charges that they had concocted by taking control of your companies. Well, it's it's actually simpler than that. So basically, we had a profit of a billion dollars in the previous year. They created fake court judgments of a billion dollars where they pled guilty to themselves of a billion dollars of fake liabilities. And then then they showed up at the tax office with a billion dollars of fake costs. And they said, look, these companies declared a billion dollars of profits last year. And they showed up with these sort of kangaroo court decisions of a billion dollars of fake losses. And they said, a billion minus a billion gives, gives you to zero. And therefore, there was no profits last year. And the $230 million of capital gains tax was paid in error. And they wanted it back. And I should just point out, if this is too complicated for everybody, that this is not my money that was being stolen. The $230 million that was stolen was the Russian government's money. Right. So you've got a bunch of corrupt Russian government officials stealing their own money. And so when we discovered this, when Sergei Magnitsky discovered this, we were sure this must be a rogue operation, because why would Putin allow his own officials to steal this money? And we thought if we just put it out in the public then the good guys would get the bad guys, and that would be the end of the story. And so that's what we did. We publicized it. We wrote criminal complaints everywhere. And then Sergei Magnitsky testified against some of these police officers who conducted the raid at the Russian State Investigative Committee, their version of the FBI. And we um, sat back and waited for the good guys to get the bad guys. It turns out that in Putin's Russia, there are no good guys, just bad guys. And instead of arresting the people who stole the money... About five weeks after Sergei testified, on 24th of November 2008, the same officers he testified against came to his home at 8 in the morning, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, where he was then tortured to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with uh, 14 inmates and 8 beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, So he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. They'd move him from cell to cell to cell in the middle of the night. And the purpose of all this was to get him to withdraw his testimony against the police officers. And they wanted to get him to sign a a false confession to say that he had stolen the $230 million. And he did so on my instruction. And Sergei was a man of unbelievable principle. And they completely misjudged him. They thought, you know, tax attorney sitting in a fancy office, he'll buckle in the first moment of pressure. But for Sergei, the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was far more painful than than what they were subjecting him to. And he refused to perjure himself. He refused to sign their false confession. And the situation just kept on escalating and getting worse and worse and worse for Sergei. And after about six months of this, his health started to fail. He started to get terrible pains in his stomach. He lost 20 kilos, or 40 pounds, 
and he was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation. And a week before the operation was due, the same people came to him, again asking for the signature on the false confession. Again, he refused. And in retaliation, they um, abruptly moved him to a different prison, a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which is considered by those who know to be one of the worst prisons in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei is that at Butyrka, they had no medical facilities. And at Butyrka, his health completely broke down. He went into constant, agonizing, ear-piercing pain. They refused him all medical attention. He and his lawyers wrote 20 different desperate requests to every different branch of the criminal justice system begging for medical attention. And every different branch either ignored or in some cases denied in writing his request for medical attention. And it got so bad that on the night of November 16th, he went into critical condition. On that night, the Butyrka authorities didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore. And so they put him in an ambulance and sent him across town to a different prison that had a medical wing. But instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell. They chained him to a bed. And then eight riot guards came into the cell with rubber batons and beat him to death. Hor- horrific. Horrifying. It's a horrifying story. He was it's a horrifying 37 story. years old. 37 years old. He a left horrifying a wife and two story. children. Uh, you write about it, and you speak about it rather eloquently as well. I've heard you talk about it before. It's hard not to listen to that story, and for whatever reason, I mean, there are many tragedies in the world, whether it's the way you tell it or the details of the story or some combination therein, it resonates for me more than most stories of injustice. And so in his memory and in the pursuit of justice for him and for other people that were involved with you and your company, this eventually led you to Congress in the United States and eventually to the passing of the Magnitsky Act, which I do want to ask you about because that's central to some of the political intrigue in the United States with the current administration. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that act is? It was eventually passed, I believe, in 2012 and signed into law by President Obama. And the surprising level of significance it's actually had in sort of inciting the Putin government and being a real sore spot for them. Could you walk us through that? So... The morning after Sergei was killed, I got the news at 7.45 a.m., and it was the most horrifying, life-destroying, painful, traumatic news I could have ever gotten. And I made a vow on that morning to his memory, to his family, and to myself that I was going to go out and use every resource I had and all my energy to go after the people who killed him and make sure they faced justice. And I've put aside all of my business activities since then and spent the last eight years on a mission to make sure that Sergei Magnitsky gets justice. And it became very clear very quickly that the Putin administration and Vladimir Putin personally were not going to allow that to happen. He personally got involved in the exoneration of everybody involved, gave them state honors and promotions and all sorts of other things. And so I said to myself, if we can't get justice inside of Russia, then we're going to get justice outside of Russia. And then the question is, how do we do that? And I came up with this idea, which is the people who did this terrible crime did it for money. They did it for $230 million. And they don't keep that money in Russia. They keep it in the West. They keep it in London and New York and Geneva. They send their girlfriends shopping trips to Milan. They send their kids to boarding school in in England. They send their uh, parents to the Cleveland Clinic. And I said to myself... This is something that we can do something about in the West. And so I I went to um, two senators, Senator Benjamin Cardin, a Democrat from Maryland, and Senator John McCain, a Republican from Arizona. I told them the story, which I've just shared with you. And uh, I said, can we ban their visas and freeze their assets? And that was the genesis of something which became known as the Magnitsky Act. And it took a couple years of lobbying and, and a, lot of, a lot of meetings and a lot of stories and a lot of maneuvering, but we eventually succeeded. And we got, in, in um, December 14th, 2012, President Obama signed the Magnitsky Act into law after passing unan- almost unanimously in the Senate and House. And we found 
the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. This is what they care about. They kill, they torture, they maim in Russia for commercial purposes, and then they keep their money in the West. And I just created a, a new technology of consequences for these people, which had never existed before. And Putin went crazy. He banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families as his first step. He then put Sergei Magnitsky on trial three years after he killed him in the first ever trial against a dead man in the history of Russia as a second step. And it became clear, he even publicly said that fighting the Magnitsky Act is the single most important foreign policy priority. And the reason why is because Putin, it turns out, we've learned recently, was one of the recipients of some of the $230 million. He basically gets a cut of every scam. And he believes that his money is at risk. And he's got a lot of money. I estimate that his net worth is $200 billion. And he thinks that all that money, which is being held by oligarchs in the West, could eventually be frozen. And that's why he cares about it so much. And so as he saw the presidential election materializing a few years ago, he believed that he might be able to influence the repeal of the Magnitsky Act. And he sent one of his emissaries, a lawyer, a woman lawyer named Natalia Veselnitskaya, to Trump Tower to meet Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort with a specific request of repealing the Magnitsky Act. And this a meeting, which everyone knows about now, has become the center of the whole Russia collusion scandal. And nobody knows exactly what happened in that meeting and what was agreed or if anything was agreed, and, and this now makes up the, the center of the, of the whole Mueller investigation. And remarkably, this story of terrible, tragic story of what happened to Sergei Magnitsky has now entered and become a part of the whole American political scandal. Do you believe, because one of the centerpieces of this conversation, at least as it's played out in the media, is that Donald Trump is compromised. He's been compromised by FSB intelligence, by, by Putin, by the government in Russia. There are some specific suggestions about how he's been compromised, but putting that aside, do you believe he has been, that he's been compromised essentially and that that's part of what's going on here? I don't know. I have no idea. And fortunately, I don't have to know because there's a person with resources which are literally infinitely greater than mine, a man named Robert Mueller, who can wiretap, he can subpoena, he can interview, he can interrogate and get evidence from everybody. And he's conducting an investigation. And when he's finished with that investigation, you'll know and I'll know and Donald Trump will know what the truth is. And I look forward to that because we're in a terribly horrible world right now where all confidence has basically disappeared because we don't know whether there was or wasn't collusion. And if there was, it's horrific. And if there wasn't, it's equally horrific. And we can't live in this world of uncertainty right now. Well, that brings us to the, you know, before, and thank you so much for the time you've lent us. Uh, you've been very gracious with it. And that li brings us to something that I would like to ask you before we go, which is, that whether or not there has been collusion to what that collusion is and, and what the specifics are of this most recent election cycle, the larger issue of a deterioration in U.S.-Russian relations and in the isolation of Russia and the turn inward that has occurred over the last two decades, for Russia, it's uniquely tragic. For Russian citizens, it's uniquely tragic and unfortunate. For the world, it's alarming and concerning because we entered or we ended the 20th century with high hopes, with Boris Yeltsin and, and Bill Clinton standing at the podium smiling and laughing and us seeing that and saying, OK, you know, the future is the U.S. and Russia holding hands into the sunlight, Casablanca. But in fact... What we have now is what many call a new Cold War, and it certainly feels like that in many ways. It's not, uh, it doesn't have the ideological aspects of the Cold War, but it's concerning, and it's concerning in light of the geopolitical issues with North Korea. It's concerning given the size of the current size of the Chinese economy and the, the Chinese government and, and all the uncertainties in this increasingly multipolar world. 
what do you see as the future for U.S. Uh, Russian relations, and and what could go right to sort of set things on a better path, in your view? Well, I think the future is very bleak. I think this is all driven ultimately by Putin's corruption. I think that he's stolen so much money that he has no no choice but to try to stay in power until he dies. I think to stay in power in a situation like this is extremely difficult. And to do so, he needs to do a lot of really terrible things in terms of domestic repression. And he needs to also do some terrible things in the West in order to distract his population with wars, foreign wars in Ukraine and Syria and other places. And I don't see a scenario where it ends nicely. So your in your view, because he is so invested, his fate is so intertwined and invested in his ability to maintain power, that he's incentivized to continue to hold it at whatever cost, and that ultimately doesn't congeal with the sort of desires and uh, goals of the United States foreign policy apparatus and military and everything else, and that those two things are going to continue to collide. He needs to have foreign enemies, and he needs to be enemies of the United States in order to distract people from hating him. They've got to hate the West. They have to hate America. He's got to stir that up. Where are you today? How does this concern you personally, your safety, and your friends and your family? I'm sure that it's not, uh, this isn't without consequence. No, I'm considered to be Putin's number one enemy because of these Magnitsky sanctions and, and the fact that we've not only gotten them in America now, I've worked in other countries. We have, we have Magnitsky sanctions in five countries, um, in Canada, the United Kingdom, Estonia, Lithuania. There's four more lined up at uh, Latvia, Ukraine, South Africa, and Gibraltar. I'm working on France, Sweden, and, uh, and Holland, and they hate my guts. And um, I've been threatened with death, with kidnapping. They've gone after me through Interpol. They, they've issued six different arrest warrants via Interpol. They've um, asked the British government on numerous occasions for my extradition. I live in London. They're after me. But, you know, my duty is to Sergei Magnitsky and, and injustice. He was much braver than I could ever be by challenging them sitting in, a, in their custody. And I owe it to him and, and to his memory and to his family that I don't stop and I carry on until justice is done. Well, Mr. Browder, I thank you for your time and um, I wish you the best with your work in servicing Sergei's memory. It's no small task and you've certainly put yourself in a difficult situation. And I, uh, I, again, I, I do wish you the best and, and I hope you stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that was my episode with Bill Browder. I want to thank Bill for being on my program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolau. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Join the conversation through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforcespod.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.